Good morning, everybody. I'll be talking about the physiology and spatial, spatial specificity of functional MRI. When we introduce a subject into, when we introduce a subject into the magnet, present sensory stimuli or motor tasks. We measure T2 star or T2 or cerebral blood flow signals. In between, there are changes in neuronal activity and changes in the vasculature. Although we measure functional MRI, most of us are really interested in changes in neuronal activity. We measure functional MRI because this is, of all non-invasive imaging methods, this is the method with the highest spatial resolution, spatial specificity as well. So uh, in order to understand what happens in terms of uh, neuronal activity, we need to learn about the transformation between neuronal activity and functional MRI and the inverse transformation. So I'll talk uh, a little bit about the basics of intracranial neurophysiology, about the physiological mechanism of the bold response, the negative bold response, resting state bold, and the spatial specificity of bold response relative to neurophysiological and metabolic activity. We'll start by introducing basic concepts of neurophysiological recordings. Neurons in the model of extracellular recordings are considered to be embedded in an extracellular medium that acts as a volume conductor. For all of us that measure local field potential or EEG or MEG, it is important to note that cortex and the brain in general is a volume conductor. When two points uh, within a neuron have different uh, potential, there is a flow of primary current, the blue one here. Unfortunately, the mouse doesn't work for me to point at, but you can see the blue arrow. That's a primary current within the neuron, and there is a nullifying current, a secondary current, through the extracellular matrix, because the extracellular matrix is conductive. So we measure exactly this extracellular nullifying current. Here is an example of recordings uh, from one electrode. We can filter this signal uh, by, uh, to frequencies that are higher than 400 hertz and to frequencies that are lower than 150 hertz. We consider the higher frequencies to represent multi-unit activity or spiking activity, and the lower frequencies to represent synchronized synaptic activity. Why do we consider it this way? Because if we look at spectra of action potentials, we can see that the energy is mainly focused at 400, 500 hertz and above. And in contrast, if we look at spectra of EPSPs, excitatory postsynaptic potentials, we can see that it is focused mainly with power below 100 or 150 hertz. So local field potential that represents synaptic activity and multi-unit activity can be separated in the frequency domain. And obviously, local field potentials can be further classified to frequency bands that are used classically in the EEG literature. What constitute the multi-unit activity and the local field potential? Multi-unit activity, as we said, we believe that it represents action potentials, very short events that are with origin very close to the electrode, on the order of 100 micron from the electrode. Local field potential, single event duration, can be 10 to 100 millisecond, and it can record data or postsynaptic potentials from up to one or two millimeter away because cortex is conductive. It represents population synaptic potential and the input to a given cortical area, but importantly, also the local intracortical processing because the majority of synapses on any neuron within cortex are with origin of 200 microns away uh, as a limit, uh, the, in the limit of the origin of the distance from that uh, neuron. So it represents also local intracortical processing. 
Before we move on to functional MRI and to the vasculature, here is a transition uh, slide that actually tells us that functional MRI signal is an indicator of overall activity of very many neurons and processes. Because within a conventional voxel at three Tesla, say two by two by two millimeters, there are approximately one million neurons and 10 to the 10th synapses. So we move on now and we'll talk, we talk about the physiological mechanism of the bold response. Uh, how, does, how do changes in the vasculature uh, end up as measurement of T2 star signal? The bold uh, principle is based on the fact that the oxyhemoglobin is paramagnetic. It has some weak properties, uh, magnetic properties, as opposed to oxyhemoglobin, which is diamagnetic. It is very, very, very weak. Uh, when the oxyhemoglobin molecules are introduced within otherwise homogeneous magnetic field, they change the flux of the magnetic field and make it non-homogeneous. We measure functional MRI in specific areas. This means that there is some control of where blood flow uh, goes to. Uh, so it's not like just increasing blood flow throughout the entire brain. Uh, we believe that the control is by arterial smooth muscles around the arteries and by pericytes that give rise to processes around capillaries and are capable of making the, the capillaries narrow or uh, dilated. The, uh, the, most of us measure the positive ball response and uh, the sequence of events in the positive ball response is as follows. There is a change in neuronal activity, increase in neuronal activity that causes increase in oxygen consumption. Uh, this increase in oxygen consumption, or actually it's the, already the change in neuronal activity in a feed forward manner, causes quite quickly to dilation of the arteries and increase in blood flow in an overcompensation manner. You can see that I wrote over there, I uh, indicated two arrows of increase in blood flow relative to only one arrow in increase in oxygen consumption. So there is overcompensation that increases the oxy, oxyhemoglobin and washes out the oxyhemoglobin. Therefore, the magnetic field becomes more homogeneous uh, the T2 star uh, signal increases and the bold signal uh, or the T2 star uh, signal increases. That's the positive bold response. We want now to relate metabolic, hemodynamic, and functional MRI signals to neuronal activity in a more direct manner. So I'll start by introducing a system of optical imaging which measures blood oxygenation and blood volume the physiology of the hemodynamic response here is identical to that that we measure with BOLD, BOLD functional MRI. The only difference is that instead of looking at magnetic properties of hemoglobin, we look at absorption spectra of hemoglobin, or more specifically, differences between absorption of the oxyhemoglobin uh, in a blue in the plot over there, and uh, oxyhemoglobin in red. You can see that at 616 nanometer illumination, uh, the oxyhemoglobin absorbs more than oxyhemoglobin. And we'll combine it with measurement of voltage sensitive dyes. These are compounds that we apply uh, topically to cortex. They bind, the compound binds to the membrane of the neurons and it fluorescence in quite a linear manner with the membrane potential. We use two cameras and we can measure both the voltage sensitive dye and the intrinsic signal. Uh, and I want you to pay attention to the time lag between the neurophysiological response and the hemodynamic response. Origin of bold signal, gray matter or vessels, where do we get more blood oxygenation and the spatial specificity relative to neuronal activity. Uh, so on the left, we have the imaging of the membrane potential with voltage sensitive dye. At the bottom is the time course. This is four-pore stimulation, electrical stimulation to the four-pore of the rat. 
And on the right, we see from the same region the blood oxygenation signal and the time course. Is it possible to start the movie, please? Technicians, is it possible to start the movies? So right now, there was a flush. That was the response to a FOPA stimulation. It's gone long time ago. Now the hemodynamic response uh, develops. Is it possible to do it again, please? Doesn't look right. Flush, development of the hemodynamic response, mainly in arteries, just a little bit in a gray matter at the lag. We want now to move on and just from demonstration to look at quantitative relationship. And here is a classical paper from 2000 from the lab of David Heger, who presented to primates and to humans a visual stimuli at different uh, luminance contrast. You can see at the left, these are, this is low contrast. On the right, a high contrast. The low goes very close to zero, the high up to about 80% uh, percent contrast. And it is known from monkey physiology that the higher the contrast, the luminance contrast, the higher the response of neurons in area V1. This can be seen by the single neurons, the, the red curve that was recorded from primates in area V1. The dark circles represent measurement in fun of functional MRI in human subjects also in V1 with the same visual stimulus. You can see that although two, the two responses are non-linear with luminance contrast, the, curve, uh, the curves obtained from the two measurements uh, pretty much follow each other, suggesting that positive ball responses in hum human V1 are proportional to average firing rates in monkey V1. Similarly, if we look at the paper, a uh, classical paper from the Lauritsen group uh, in the cerebellum, stimulation of the climbing fibers and the parallel fibers during neurophysiological recordings from Purkin cells and laser Doppler, we can see that a stimulation of the climbing fibers it causes linear increase in cerebellar blood flow as a function of local field potential, and on the right, stimulation of the parallel fibers it causes monotonous increase, but it's more a, of a sigmoidal function relative to the local field potential. So the hemodynamic response in many instances is approximately linear with the underlying neuronal spike activity. Non-linearities non between the hemodynamic response and neuronal activity have been observed. In the vast majority of cases, the hemodynamic response and the bold response increase monotonously with increasing neuro neurophysiological activity. Which type of neuronal activity is reflected by bold? Spikes or synaptic activity? We already showed that positive bold response in human V1 are proportional to average firing rates in V1 of the monkey cortex. So does the bold reflect spiking activity? Uh, obviously, not necessarily, because correlation does not mean causation. And it is uh, possible that uh, action potential spiking activity is correlated with bold response through a third mechanism, such as synaptic activity, that we can measure with local field potential. And indeed, uh, from the same classical paper from Lauritsen, uh, we can see here at the bottom stimulation of the parallel fibers, that's where you see the blips at the bottom curve, that causes increases in cerebellar blood flow, although in the top lot, the number of action potentials diminishes. There's almost no action potentials of the local poor kinesis. So this demonstrates a dissociation of spike rate and blood flow, which means that cere cerebellar blood flow does not depend on action potential and is likely to reflect synaptic activity. In cortex, things are more complicated because everything is connected to everything uh, locally. Uh, so here's a demonstration from uh, another classical paper by Logothetis et al. Uh, the uh, black curve represents the extracellular recordings. The yellow curve 
represents a decimated or the overall envelope of uh, the extracellular recordings. And the red curve showing the lag in a very clear manner, the bold response associated with this increase in your physiological activity. So in this slide, we see here, uh, again, a response to rotating checkers in the visual cortex. The electrode is in V1. And the duration of the stimulus changes from 24 seconds on the upper panel to 12 seconds in the middle panel and four seconds at the bottom panel. Uh, we can see uh, in the background, uh, in pink, the bold response. And we can see that the bold response follows the duration of the stimulus with the lag. In contrast, the spike density function or the multi-unit activity in green and in blue are transient. They show only a transient response, so they cannot uh, really explain or account for these long, uh, bold responses. In contrast, if we look at the local field potential in the gamma domain, it is prolonged similarly uh, to the stimulus and can explain better, because of that, can explain the better the bold response. So the bold response reflects changes in local field potential or synaptic activity, input to and local processing in a region more than multi-unit activity or output of a region. I'll devote a, a two slides here to a very important uh, topic about signal-to-noise ratio, or better phrased, contrast-to-noise ratio of neurophysiological responses and functional MRI. Uh, from the same study of logothetis, we can see a signal-to-noise ratio for neural and homodynamic signals. The stimulus, the visual stimulus, starts uh, at 10 seconds on the time, uh, on the horizontal axis of the time. To the left, we see the neuronal activity in standard deviation units of the baseline, during the baseline before the onset of the stimulus. And the neuronal activity in standard deviation units uh, is represented by the greenish surface. Uh, in contrast, the blue curve represents the bold response. And again, in standard deviation units of the bold baseline before the onset of the stimulus, and the scale is represented to the right. So we can see on the left that neuronal response, uh, the onset is almost immediate upon presentation of the stimulus, and it gets to 60 standard, deviation, uh, standard deviations higher than the baseline of the neurophysiological fluctuations before the presentation of the stimulus. In contrast, after six seconds from the onset of the stimulation, the bold response is at about 2.2 standard deviations above uh, its own, uh, or relative to its own baseline. This means that the contrast to noise ratio of uh, neurophysiology, neurophysiological recordings is uh, higher, uh, much higher than that of the bold signal, and therefore thresholding methods are not sufficiently averaging are likely to underestimate a great deal of actual neuronal activity related to the stimulus or task. It was actually shown later on by the Bandettini uh, group that if you uh, take a subject and you repeat a paradigm of functional MRI over five sessions, you can increase or you get many more additional areas that show responses. Virtually the entire brain responds to a sensory a stimulus a, or motor task, many areas are involved, and the only way to get to that is by a, averaging a lot, much more than what we are used to. So I'll change gear now and I'll talk about uh, negative bold responses that we can see here uh, in response to partial visual, uh, partial visual uh, field stimulation, stimulation of only the visual field with flickering uh, checkers that uh, shows positive ball response or creates positive ball response in the areas where the checkers are represented retinotopically and negative ball responses otherwise. Here it is shown 
uh, both in bold to the left and cerebral blood flow to the right in the human visual cortex. Now, mechanism could be interpreted as either vascular, meaning increases in cerebral blood flow to one area causes uh, through vascular effects, reduce cerebral blood flow in uh, another area, or it could be interpreted as a neuronal effect, meaning uh, increases in neuronal activity in one area induces suppression of neuronal activity in another uh, that causes decrease in cerebral blood flow. And of course, the, the, choosing or selecting the right one per your paradigm is extremely important. In one case, we can interpret the, ball, the negative ball response as an artifact. In another case, as information which is valuable, response to the stimulus or to the task. Uh, so that's a study that I uh, pursued together with uh, Nikos Logotetis. We can see an electrode near the green arrow in V1 of monkeys. And to the left, we can see the receptive field of the neurons near the electrode in green. And we used two stimuli. One stimulus overlapped the receptive field, and the other did not overlap the receptive field. As we expected already from the human study, the overlapping stimulus induced positive ball response near the electrode. The non-overlapping stimulus induced negative ball response. Here's the, uh, we, we use the region of interest around the electrode uh, in the gray matter, sampled the ball response, and indeed we see an average of several sessions here a negative ball response with the non-overlapping stimulus, not also the uh, sort of, uh, uh, the, in, the, in the blue curve of the negative ball response, when the stimulus is released, you can see an overshoot in the negative ball response that can also be seen in the neurophysiological data that was recorded simultaneously. Immediately at the end of the stimulus, you can see an overshoot and of course, during the stimulus, you can see decreases in neuronal activity associated with the negative ball response. So that's the mean power of the local field potential. And the, this phenomenon can be also seen in just measuring action potentials. And therefore, a negative ball responses in this paradigm can be interpreted as decreases or cerebral blood flow decrease due to decrease in neuronal activity. A recent paper used uh, optogenetics in order to study the mechanism of negative ball responses. So uh, uh, Ulurova from Anna Davos lab used optogenetics in order to selectively activate inhibitory neurons in the somatosensory cortex of mice. And she showed an increase in hemodynamic, or in this case, in dilation of arteries, arterials and arteries, in response to optogenetic stimulation of inhibitor neurons that is followed by a prolonged uh, um, constriction of the arteries. And they suggest, or these results suggest, that inhibitor neurons may be a possible cause for negative ball responses. Conclusions regarding negative ball response. In a majority of study cases, negative ball responses are associated with decreases in your physiological activity. Negative ball responses that are not spatially adjacent to positive ball responses most likely reflect decreases in neuronal activity. We'll talk now about neuronal activity underlying resting state bold. We all know that many uh, studies have been conducted about a uh, resting state spontaneous activity and functional connectivity based on functional MRI, spontaneous fluctuations, do these spontaneous fluctuations reflect neurophysiological activity? Uh, this is uh, not trivial that they do reflect neurophysiological activity because several papers, including the one I present here from Birn et al., showed that physiological fluctuations, subject motion, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, do contribute significantly to spontaneous fluctuations in fMRI signal. In this case, we see that the respiration volume per time correlates with functional MRI signal and creates a map that can be interpreted as a network during resting state. So we need to be careful about that. In a study conduct that I conducted with David Leopold, 
we measured simultaneously functional MRI in monkey V1 together with neurophysiological recording simultaneously. We, in order to get the two signals to the same time domain of one sample per second, we computed the spectrogram uh, that you can, you can see on the top right from the neurophysiological signal and we sampled it at one second which was identical to the TR of the functional MRI. So now we can correlate power of gamma or multi-unit multi activity or just measuring the number of action potentials per time with the fluctuations in bolt signal. When we do that, to the left, we can see a, a hemodynamic response-like function of the correlation between fluctuations and bold and neurophysiological activity that on the right is gone if we break the simultaneity condition, meaning if we shuffle the neurophysiological recordings relative to the fluctuations in bold, suggesting that this is not a false positive result. So this is in the broadband and in gamma activity, multi-unit activity, and spike rate. Uh, the spatial extent of the correlation relative to the site of where we recorded with neurophysiology is quite wide in the visual cortex, pretty much whatever the, uh, pretty much whatever the surface call of functional MRI was able to detect. Uh, here is a follow-up uh, from David Leopold's study, again showing that the spatial extent is actually even more than just the visual cortex. It goes to parietal cortex as well, uh, which uh, confirms what we know or is in line with what we know from resting state in humans about long-range uh, functional uh, correlations in the resting state. So spontaneous fluctuations in fMRI signals in V1 correlate with the locally measured fluctuations in the local field potential gamma activity, multi-unit activity, and spike rate. The neuronal and hemodynamic signals are correlated over large regions of the visual cortex. I want to add that recent studies showed that independent of these results, on top of these results, there are likely also very slow fluctuations in membrane potential. Uh, in fluctuations that are as slow as resting state fluctuations uh, in functional MRI, and both contribute, both the results that I present here and the very slow fluctuations contribute to fluctuations in fMRI signal. So other cases in which a clear neuronal cause to changes in bolt signal cannot be found. Uh, so here is one example, there are not that many, but here is one example from DAS laboratory in the monkey. Uh, we can see to the left where stimulus is written in red, we can see responses of blood volume that are inverted because that's optical imaging. We can see responses to visual stimuli and on the right we see weaker responses in dark. And these responses as shown by the DAS laboratory are there simply because of the progression of the trial to trial expectation by the monkey. And they have no, as far as uh, DAS measured, they have no clear neurophysiological correlates. Possible explanations is that this is an effect of neuromodulators, including uh, noradrenaline, which is released by the locus coriolis, when the primate has a task and he expects to uh, apply or pursue this task. So the noradrenaline level increases uh, in uh, conjunction with the trial structure. Conclusion, neuronal correlates of functional MRI bolt signals under most of the conditions, but not always, but most of the conditions, functional MRI signals are approximately proportional to the overall local neuronal activity. I believe that to draw more conditions or more conclusions when using just non-invasive functional MRI is difficult. But this take home message, I think, is very strong for the very, very majority of functional MRI measurements. Changes in functional MRI reflect changes in the overall neuronal activity within the voxel. 
Uh, so with the permission of uh, Tor uh, and Nico, I will use three more minutes to present uh, the last uh, topic, uh, which is the spatial specificity of the ball response relative to neurophysiological and metabolic activity. Uh, here's a recent study from Vanderbilt uh, University, the lab of uh, John Gore, that imaged in marmosets, a small primate, bald and f to the left, and followed by neurophysiological recordings from arrays on the right. So it's not simultaneous, it's in succession. And they used the, the same stimulation of digits and measured responses in the somatosensory region of the marmoset. And what they show is that the profile of the response to bold and neurophysiological activity is very similar. And if they measure at the bottom left the full width at half max of the point spread function, they get both for bold and local field potential about one millimeter, assuming that point spread function is a Gaussian. We obtained recently similar results in humans uh, the principle is that we observed that previous studies that estimated the spatial specificity, including my own study, uh, used retinotopic stimuli uh, in the visual cortex, partial visual field stimulation. However, this stimulus is known from monkey physiology to create scatter of neuronal response. The neuronal response itself has a, quite a certain uh, and reasonable spread. So previous estimation of the point spread function uh, in humans uh, based on bold, uh, bold response uh, account for both the spread of the neurophysiological activity and the bold response. In order to circumvent this problem and to measure uh, or estimate the point spread function of the bold response itself, we looked at point spread function of differential spin echo bold and gradient echo bold responses in humans at seven Tesla while avoiding neurophysiological spread confound. We did that by fitting a model of imaging cortical columns presented previously by Chaimo et al. in 2011. We fitted this model to measurement of ocular dominance that Isaiah Kub and I uh, performed previously at the University of Minnesota. So, and we also obtained uh, we constrained the parameter space based on post-mortem cytochrome, uh, cytochrome oxidase histology from humans from Adams et al. So the idea is the following. The model to the left creates it in each iteration a probable neurophysiological activity map of ocular dominance response. It then simulates the ball response to the bottom left and it checks what is the probability of getting this simulated bold response given the current parameters and the data which is presented to the right? What, we, what you see here is a demonstration of uh, the first iterations, about 1% uh, first iterations of this uh, simulation and fitting of the data to our, uh, fitting of the model to the data. Is it possible to run the movie, please? So you can see at the bottom the simulated ocular dominance at the top, the measured ocular dominance. Pretty soon, the simulated or pretty quickly at the be after the onset of the simulation, the ocular dominance, the simulated ocular dominance converge to the actual measured ocular dominance. And on the right, you can see the width of the point spread function of spin echo which converges to about 0.8 millimeter and gradient echo to about one millimeter. So our results are similar to what uh, John Gore obtained in the primate. And this takes in account already the spread of the neuronal response. Uh, that's the final result. We get the probability density function for the point spread of spin echo responses and gradient echo responses uh, that are about for gradient echo one millimeter and spin echo a 0.8 millimeter. So conclusions regarding the spatial specificity of the ball response, the ball response, especially under conditions of differential analysis, one stimulus minus the other, 
reflect the underlying neuronal responses in high fidelity. I would like to thank you for your attention.